Thank you. Uh, thank you, Kayla. Thank you for the uh, invitation. Um, so today I'll be talking about this um, collaborative work between my lab at um, Applied Physical Science, UNC Chapel Hill, and Amy Gladfelter's lab at, uh, in the biology department. And the talk is going to be about these uh, green labeled proteins that are forming filaments called septin. Um, and septins are, as you can kind of tell uh, by looking at this movie, they uh, go and uh, aggregate in areas of high curvature in eukaryotic cells. And we want to kind of understand how they do that. How do they sense the curvature, um, uh, these septins? And whatever I'm going to tell you, it's going to be in this uh, bioarchive article. Um, uh, the paper is in uh, review in PNAS, but uh, it's basically the same version as the bioarchive. So let's get started. Um, so when we talk about cells, um, typically the conceptual point of view that we have is that cell is this really complicated reactor with a bunch of uh, uh, very complicated pathways of um, involving different reactions, or more recently, we think about cell as a machine made out of uh, smaller machines. But what is, I guess, to a lesser degree appreciated is how geometrically complex cell and cellular structures can be. Um, and complex geometry is a fundamental aspect of life. And one example where this is really shown uh, nicely is uh, the plasma membrane and the shapes it takes across different scales. So you look at this um, image in the middle, where is the, the nervous system, uh, uh, the neural network, and uh, you can see if you zoom in the plasma membrane um, from uh, like very small scales, you get these um, areas of high curvature, these uh, spherical particles that show up in 100 nanometer scale and all the way to um, tens of mic uh, microns in length scale. So the ability of the cellular structures to sense, control, and transmit these uh, geometrical information is key to many cellular processes. It allows them to compartmentalize uh, proteins and uh, things that they want to send to a particular location. Um, so it's really critical to understand how membrane in particular understands its own shape uh, or senses it. And of course, in this talk, we're just gonna be focusing on sensing and not really inducing shape or transmitting the information, only the sensing component of this. So there are many, many different sensors that operate in different uh, lens scales, uh, specifically designed to sense membrane curvature. And from those, we're gonna be interested in um, let me admit this. Interested in uh, septins as I talk to you about them. So septins are nanoscopic and length scale. The oligomer itself is only 32 nanometers across, but they can sense the curvature in micron scale in eukaryotic cells. Um, so um, there's uh, a huge change in um, length scale. And this, the example you see is the Ashbia fungus, where you see that wherever you get these branches, you get these accumulations of septins around those branch areas that have higher curvature. You can see this better in this image, where you see the localization of septins to these areas of high positive curvature. So the interior part is the part that we're interested in. Septin is inside this thing, and it goes and accumulates in areas of high positive curvature. And the other example where septins are very critical uh, to sensing curvature is uh, in budding yeast. Uh, and as the cell divides and forms this neck, uh, the septins are um, accumulating in areas of high positive curvature in the budding yeast as well. So these are two prominent examples in eukaryotic cells where septins uh, sense the curvature. As I said, the oligomer itself is 32 nanometers across. And it has these two antennas called amphipathic helices. So these are helical structures with where the hydrophobic and hydrophilic sides kind of twist with the helical structure. So one side is positively charged, you can think of it, and the other one, uh, like hydrophilic, and the other part is hydrophobic. 
And this 32 nanometer thing, we're asking it to sense a micron scale curvature. It's like staring at the ocean and trying to pick out that the earth is not flat and um, it has a curvature. So how do these things do that? So to do this, um, Amy Gladfilter's lab has found a way to uh, take uh, study these in vitro by um, using the recombinantly expressed and purified yeast septins. They take them out and then they have beads of different radii. They coat these beads with uh, membranes, uh, lipids, uh, bilayers, and then there's a solution of septins and they look at and see which curvature these uh, septins would like to bind better on. And what they see is that there is an optimal curvature where the absorption is maximized over there. So it's not just that curvature, uh, they like higher curvature, they have an optimal curvature in these systems. And what they also found out is that if you take those antennas away, so the amphipathic helices, if you cut them, sever them, then you lose that curvature sensitivity and the curvature, uh, the absorption kind of remains independent of curvature. So what we get out of this is that amphipathic helices, which we refer to here as AH domains here on, um, are required for septin curvature sensing. So, so far we have, this directs us to conclude this. But then the question is, if, the a if every septin comes with an AH domain, is a single septin alone sufficient to probe this micron scale curvature? So the curvature sensing occurs in single septin level or a larger scale. So some of the information we have from their experiments suggests otherwise, that it's not just a single oligomer scale sensing mechanism. And one of those examples is, for example, if I talked to you guys about in the previous slide, I showed the results of absorption versus curvature uh, in a polydispersed assay. And if I go back, uh, just sorry, if I go back to this slide, so one micron was the maximum absorption, and it goes all the way. Um, so as you increase the radius, uh, the curvature is decreased. So five micron would be to the left of this. So five micron beads have less absorption than the one micron if you do a polydispersed assay. So all the beads have different, a combination of different radii in a single assay. Now, if we do this other experiments where we separate the beads of different radii and do the experiments individually of beads of different radii and see which ones have larger absorption, what we see is that the trend changes. Instead of one micron being the optimal absorption of septins, five micron beads have larger absorption. So by just going to a monodispersed assay, we have changed the curvature sensitivity of septins. Now, if we do the bidispersed version of the same assay, meaning putting together these two beads um, in the same assay, we again go back to the polydispersed observation where my, one micron is the winner, it has the larger absorption. So this points to the fact that uh, preferred binding might actually be um, a function of the available curvatures in the system. And it's not a determined individually on single septin scale. If it was single septin scale, these shouldn't have changed the results. The other thing we can do is change the bulk concentration of septins in the chamber that these experiments are done and see if the curvature sensitivity changes. And what we see is that is you, if you reduce the bulk concentration, you lose the curvature sensitivity again, and you kind of see the same absorption from um, one and five micron beads. So this also tells you that the bulk concentration of septins is also important for their curvature sensitivity. All of these basically tell you that single oligomer scale is not the determining factor in uh, determining the curvature sensitivity. Uh, so the preferred curvature, it can also be a function of septin assembly. These observations kind of 
made us hypothesize that maybe the curvature is an emergent property of the system and uh, not necessarily determined in simple molecular scale. Okay, so we decided to study the assembly process, which I lay out here in multiple steps. The assembly starts with a single oligomer binding to the membrane. And upon binding, these oligomers can diffuse and connect and form larger filaments through the annealing or fertilization process. This has been observed experimentally, they form filaments. And uh, they can also have higher order structures. This is observed in vitro, but maybe it happens in um, in vivo settings as well, or in this bead experiments that we're doing now. So uh, we wanted to study these processes and see how each of them can affect the curvature sensitivity. So we start with the single oligomer um, and study the kinetics of binding and unbinding of a single oligomer. Let me see if I can minimize this somehow. But bring it down here. Um, single oligomer. So the, to do this, uh, Amy's lab, Amy Gladford's lab, used near turf microscopy. They look at the binding and unbinding events of uh, single dots that appear. These septins are tagged, so you can look at them under the microscope. So you can see how each, how long each dot lives. That gives you the dwell time, which is the inverse of the off rate. And also you can see how many dots are appearing per unit time to get the binding rate. And what we see is that the binding rate increases. And these uh, single oligomers, I should say that they cannot polymerize. So it's only focusing on single oligomer dynamics here. So, they, the binding rate increases with curvature monotonically, we see that. And what we observe is that the off rate, the unbinding rate or dwell time, the inverse of dwell time, remains kind of independent of curvature. So if we think of, um, if you write this down as a simple kinetic equation, the steady state density of bound uh, septins is gonna be just the ratio of on rate to off rate. So that tells us that the absorption would monotonically increase with curvature for a single oligomer. So they can't choose a preferred curvature. Rather, the higher the curvature, the larger the absorption. So this is not sufficient for curvature optimality, let's call it. Um, so single oligomer cannot choose a preferred curvature. Let's now go to the next scales, which involves filament formation and higher order structures. So to study this, and because we wanted to have kinetic information, we needed to study this as a function of time. We developed these uh, cham chambers, um, Amy Gladfilter's lab, and they, uh, they flow the septin cocktail essentially through these chambers and look at the absorption of septin on these beads as a function of time. And we do so in different bulk concentrations and uh, bead sizes uh, to study both effect of curvature and bulk concentration. And we do this on monodispersed assays and poly uh, bidispersed assays. So only one in five micron and a combination of them in a single bidis in, in bidispersed assays. Okay, and these are the results we get. Um, we show the absorption as a function of time. And now this absorption, we don't know how it's tied exactly to, uh, we know that it's proportional to the total uh, density of uh, septins bound to this uh, membrane, but we don't know the proportionality constant. We just know it's proportional to it. So um, you, you see the results for monodispersed uh, assays on top left and middle, and the bidispersed assays, we only have it for 25 nanomolar bulk concentrations for uh, one and five micron uh, beads. Uh, so what you see out of these is that it, absorption as a function of time forms this S-shaped um, uh, curve uh, where you have in the beginning some lag time where absorption remains very small up to a point where it starts to kick off and you get this super linear growth in concentration as a function of time. 
And then you reach to this um, saturation uh, constant, saturation concentration, that where concentration remains constant over time. What we see also is that as you increase the bulk concentration or increase the curvature or decrease the size, uh, you see that the lag time for higher curvature goes down and higher bulk concentration, the growth rate, growth time goes down and the saturation time goes down or the rates, alternatively, we can say that everything is uh, speeding up by increasing the bulk concentration and curvature. All the kinetics are increasing um, their rates. The other thing we can note here is that if you look at the uh, two largest concentrations in all these absorption curves, uh, they seem to have a nice, uh, they seem almost identical to each other. So the kinetics, as well as the values of saturation absorption remains the same for the two largest concentrations. And the third observation that we kind of alluded to in the previous slides is that as you go from, in the monodispersed case, the absorption, if you look at the curves um, in one micron, the maximum absorption goes to 0.2, whereas in five micron, it goes to 0.4. And if you go to bidispersed assays, this trend is reversed. The one micron comes on top and the five micron goes below. So that's the third observation. So as I said, um, we're interested in modeling. Now we're gonna turn into model to see if we can model the assembly process and through modeling in comparison with experiments, we can determine the role of each of these sub processes in curvature, determining the curvature sensitivity. So um, the binding events, how uh, the oligomers are attached to the membrane, we consider two binding mechanisms. One of them is associated with uh, the oligomer directly binding to the membrane. And the second mechanism that we assume for binding is, let's say you have some bound uh, septins and they help recruit other septins from the bulk to the membrane. So they uh, cooperate with uh, the septins in the bulk to facilitate the binding process that we call cooperativity mechanism, uh, shown as five here. Then there's upon binding, you have diffusion and endon annealing. By endon, I mean that the, the septins come together through their ends and form a longer septin or longer filament. The sept and these have been observed experimentally. There's evidence for these things. And um, fragmentation is a process where septin breaks, a longer septin breaks into tinier pieces. This has also been observed experimentally. And finally, they can come off of the membrane through the unbinding process. So to model this system, we can't really go and do molecular dynamics or coarse grain molecular dynamics because the scale of these things is it takes 60 minutes for this whole assembly to happen. So it's far beyond any uh, sort of di uh, mechanical model that resolves the structures. Instead, what we do here is use Malachowski aggregation equation to kind of model, to develop a kinetic model for these processes and kind of put mechanics as uh, we don't look at mechanics directly here. It comes as these kinetic constant through our equations. So most of the work I, we did for this work is kind of in this single slide. I'm gonna try to give a very brief description of this. I'm happy to talk to you guys about the details uh, if you're interested. So, Let's talk about, uh, so th in this slide, whatever I'm showing here with red uh, means that it's an unknown parameter that we can't determine experimentally. It has to come through least square optimization through comparison between the predictions and experimental result. Um, so we have the binding rates. I told you it's a direct binding and cooperative binding. The direct binding, if you think of septins, binding to the membrane, what we consider here is very simple. We assume that there is a defect dynamics uh, formation and healing dynamics on the membrane. 
and the septins can attach to these defects with a given rate. So based on these simple assumptions, you can get the flux of septins binding to the membrane um, and that you, I show here, J on here. So NB is just the bulk concentration. N saturation uh, that you see here is the maximum uh, saturation density of bound septins um, for each curvature. And uh, beta parameter is uh, the parameter that kind of shows the competition between defect healing rate and septin binding rate. And the cooperative binding, the one that involved bound septins helping septins from the bulk to recruit to the membrane is the same as the direct one, except for this extra very important parameter of N shown here in blue, multiplying the whole thing. So N is the total density of uh, bound uh, septins on uh, the membrane. So the more you put in, it recruits more. So it's a positive feedback mechanism here. It leads you to this super linear growth that you see on the absorption curves. And then the third equation I show for the binding rates, it's essentially the mass conservation. As the reaction goes on, you deplete the septins from the bulk um, and uh, that's it. Uh, for unbinding rates, we assume that if the septin is made out of I number of septin oligomer, so septin of a longer length, let's say, that the unbinding for this, that septin to unbind, it has to come, every individual component needs to come off the membrane. So if you uh, just apply this assumption, you see that the off rate of a septin of I unit, made of I unit, exponentially decays with I. Um, so that's the basic assumption here. And then the annealing and fragmentation rates. For the annealing rate, we considered an effective annealing rate, which involved both the time it takes to diffuse two particles, the two particles to diffuse and meet, and then react. So what we found out through sensitivity analysis after we got our results, and also through back of the envelope calculation, is that the diffusion time or the time it takes for the septins to meet through diffusion is a lot less than the time it takes for them to react. So we can forget about the diffusion uh, time scale and just model the annealing with this simple formula and a simple formula for fragmentation. So that's basically all the parameters of the model. And then we can go on and see how our model compares against experiments. Um, and we can see that the model does a nice job predicting the overall behaviors of absorption as a function of time. Another caveat of the model is that it gives you length distribution. I don't discuss it here because we don't have a direct way of um, seeing length distribution in experiments. But it looks like it captures the monodispersed behavior pretty well. And then um, the other, perhaps even more important, is that with the same set of parameters, we can see that it, the model can capture this transition of going from uh, monodispersed to bidispersed and the switching of curvature preference between one and five microns. It can capture that very nicely. So our idea as to how this happens is that when you have monodispersed, um, uh, assays. Uh, you have a, um, for uh, five microns, the dynamics or uh, kinetics are uh, slower. And because of this slower kinetics, the uh, septins that are falling on the membrane and are bound to it, they have more time to rearrange and more efficiently pack themselves um, uh, and form higher maximum absorption. Whereas um, for uh, one micron uh, septins uh, uh, beads, uh, you have a faster kinetic, so they don't have they don't quite as much pack efficiently. So that leads to larger absorption on five micron beads compared to one micron beads when you have monodispersed case. Now, when you have bidispersed case. What happens is that you have a limited pool of septins in the bulk, and the fast guy, which is the one micron bead, 
takes most of the septins from the bulk, leaving the five micron with very little left. So you end up getting less absorption on the larger B. Even though if they were put it separately, five can do it well, but it needs time. But time is not something it has in this particular case because most of the septin is gonna be depleted by that time. So that's our idea of how this competition for limited resources can give rise to different curvature sensing in monodispersed and bidispersed assays. Uh, so how do we test this idea? We thought about, okay, uh, this, since this comes from competition, if we extend the, uh, if we change, um, uh, vary the extent, there's a typo over there, vary the extent of depletion by varying the total bead area. So if you reduce the bead area, you have less depletion in the bulk. And uh, so for that, we would expect to go back to the monodispersed trend because there's not much competition going on if uh, there's not much depletion in the bulk. Whereas if you increase the bead area, the total bead area, meaning increasing the number of beads, you should go back to one micron beads being the winners. And we did that and thankfully we saw this uh, uh, working out. So we do exactly see the same trend um, experimentally. So as you decrease the surface area, the ratio between one and five micron absorptions goes down and the trend is reversed, just like we expected to see from this comp competition uh, model. So I, I would just end with um, saying that all I told you, basically the main message here is that when you think about septin as a curvature sensor, you can't think of the unit as the sensor. The unit just initializes the process. It binds to higher curvatures better, but it is through this binding and unbinding and breaking and fragmentation and the assembly process that the curvature preference emerges. Uh, so it's an emergent property of this multi-scale, multi-step assembly. And it's a good part about this is that you, depending on the cell's needs, you can modulate these, cell can modulate these concentrations and geometries and achieve different curvature sensitivity, which is something we often see in cellular structures that uh, they have different ways of, um, it's an interesting mechanism to give it more freedom to do things in the, uh, different things in different contexts. And with that, I'll, be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, thank you, Asan, for the very interesting talk. Uh, we do have a few questions from the audience. Yeah, um, that they will see how I can back. get this working. Um, they, uh, um, the, uh, the questioners can speak up if they want to ask the questions themselves. Uh, Amrin there? Yeah. Uh, hi. Good morning, Asan. Very nice talk. Thank you. It's a very interesting. So my question was coming more from a mechanistic point of view also. I was trying to inquire, like, do you have any specific thoughts on the stiffness of those tails? Because when you remove them, so I'm just trying to picture what is the role of those tails and is it the backbone that is curving around or it buckles inside and uh, okay. you're showing a limit of one micron. And the whole question is like, if you go down to let's say hundred nanometers. That's right, very good question. Uh, so I don't have the videos to show you here, but we were looking at, we started doing molecular dynamic simulations of these only the helices. So the way you can think of them um, is, um, uh, so the rigidity is definitely important uh, the, but to help you see it is, so the lipid bilayer has uh, hydropho hydrophilic heads and hydrophobic tails. And this thing, uh, AH domain, uh, let me see if I can draw it for you. So the AH domain, um, it's going to be hard. It has this, um, what's the feature I can use to draw? It has, uh, imagine a helix, the north and south of this helix have different hydrophobicity and hydrophilic nature. So 
it kind of goes in, it's like a screw. It goes around shallowly inserting itself to the membrane and it aligns its hydrophilic part with the hydrophobic part of the membrane and hydrophobic part with the, uh, so it, it kind of the charges work in a way that it goes through the membrane, weaves through it, um, that's what we see. So the helicity is very important for it to line up those charges and those attractions and repulsions. It's very shallow insertion. It doesn't go deep inside. And um, the rigidity is obviously very important because it allows it, the way it, it can, it's also as it, this is what we find, we don't know exactly, um, we need to do more work, but if the AH domain stretches or compresses, it changes these charge distributions a little bit. And so, it, for example, it can take a tilted angle when it goes inside the membrane or a straight angle. There's a lot of interesting stuff just for that antenna and how it behaves. And it starts everything. It kickstarts everything. Um, so a follow-up yeah. follow question would be, so if you are lining these up as in your last cartoon, you had a lot of them lined up going yeah. radially out. Would they line up radially out or would they spread on, on the surface preferentially? It's, it's going to be, so the AH domain, so the septin is like a rod, think of it. The AH domains are coming orthogonal to the rod, but as they bind to the surface, they kind of become aligned with the surface. So it, they can, they're surface attached. They're not going deep inside. And if you put a multiple of them, um, the, the answer is we don't know because we haven't done any simulations to see how they line up. But the septins, what we found out from our calculations is that for these um, depletion effects to come to play a role, the septins must be multiple layers. So it's not just one layer on the top. There's things coming on top of the septins forming multi-layered structures. So the way the AH domains play a role in that multi-layered assembly is really not known. Uh, we don't have a good sense of where they are, how they align. Sure. Yeah. Uh, well, the thank you very much. Time, yeah. Can, we, yeah. uh, can we ask the questions from uh, two others? Uh, and then we can stay after for a discussion. So there is a question from Nancy. Nancy, uh, you can ask the question. Yourself. Thank you. Uh, yeah, really interesting talk, Esan. I think the question I was asking was back when you first showed the mono versus bi competitions, yeah. and I was wondering about whether the total surface area was controlled, but I think you kind of addressed that at the end. Yes, so, it, it's the same surface area. The, we keep the surface areas between the mono and between different sizes the same. Yeah, in great. The so may I ask a question that kind of arose later in the talk, and that is you've got this kinetic versus sort of thermodynamic, if I will, competition going on, right? Yes. Um, in your static bead curvatures, but of course in the cell, you have particularly the idea of the yeast and the fission, the, the neck forming, it's changing with time, right? Yes. So you need to recruit things there, but you also need to hold on and do the job uh, that is needed biologically. So I'm wondering if you could comment on how you think this plays out in a dynamic curvature environment. Yeah, so you raise a good point. It's chemistry, geometry, and mechanics, right? Um, and uh, we try to eliminate change in geometry and mechanics through this, whatever we did. But I can tell, my comment would be it's really hard and um, it's really hard to do. So uh i what this tells us is that in those dynamic situation you can kind of see how it plays out is the kinetics is important right as they bind there's the energetics they're going to deform this thing and based on the local deformation it's going to be very complicated i don't have a good answer uh, you got to go and actually simulate it or look at it to see what happens and we're thinking in those directions. But I, I, what I would do, I would just try to kind of isolate the effects if we can in some way and then combine them systematically to understand what happens. But very, it's, yep, 
it's true it's hard it's not there yet yeah but there's a lovely start to it so uh, nice yeah. work thank you uh, we'll ask uh, robin to ask uh, the last questions uh, robin okay. Thank you. Uh, very nice talk, Asan. Um, I was wondering whether these filaments, in the, following your model, uh, are actually living polymers with an exponential size distribution, and do they form a nematic phase with potential singularities on a spherical surface? And then this is similar to the previous question. If you have a deformable surface, what is the nature of the curvature induced by filamentous structure? Is it cylindrical, you think? That's my question. Very good question. So, um, so one, the first one was about uh, whether they form nematic phase. Uh, so, uh, column, whether they are first, are they forming? Do they have an exponential right. size distribution in your model? Yeah. So they show a gamma distribution. It's not totally exponential, but so. Um, I wish I had backup slides, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, but it's a gamma distribution with um, average lengths being in the range of one, uh, like 500 nanometers to two microns. Um, and that's the maximum. Uh, so we don't have uh, shorter ones. The shorter ones are gonna be less uh, probable and the longer ones are very, very improbable. Um, so that's the prediction. Um, and if you play with the, that's actually one of the parameters we use to do the optimization. If you play with the parameters, the length distribution changes significantly. And um, what the interesting observation also is that when they see the septins in, our in yeast, they have the same sort of range of length distribution. So we recover the physiological length distribution as well. Okay. And um, I'm gonna see if I have the talk okay. here. Um, um, one of them. They the next form very dense liquid crystal phases uh -huh. on this, okay. uh, sphere. Yeah. So there's definitely defects um, based on they done, they've done dynamic AFM and SEM method. Uh, they form liquid crystalline pneumatic phase. And the nature of the deformations, they have seen uh, some protrusions of cylindrical shape in some cases. Sometimes you see spikes appearing if you make your beat deformable you have um, spikes appearing in some studies that i've seen um, but honestly uh, there's very few works on it and it remains an open question what kinds of forces these guys apply to the membrane as they deform it yeah it's not well understood very interesting thank you thank you thank okay, you so uh, i'll stop the recording now <laughs>